Um, and and they have sort of reached this uh, looking at the concept of excess mortality, uh, looking at the previous years and the trends in mortality, and then sort of trying to, uh, you know, extrapolate on the basis of that. The um, positive, as far as the positivity rate is concerned, I think this is now coming down quite a bit. Uh, in May, June 2020, um, a zero survey had a zero survey had conducted, and it was said that about 0.7 percent of India uh, was infected. In January 2021, uh, that number rose to about 20 percent, uh, according to the Indian Council for Medical Research. Um, in April 2022, uh, in April 2021, um, the peak in Delhi, for instance, the capital city, was 36.2 percent. And for another week, it was at 30% positivity rate. The national positivity rate as of uh, day before yesterday is 4.3%, which is a huge come down and a big relief for us. Uh, New Delhi's, pos Delhi's positivity rate uh, is today about 0.3%, um, and, and which is also uh, pretty encouraging as it were. Um, I think one of the, one of the uh, curious things that we are finding today is that the younger population is getting in, impacted by the second wave uh, than they were impacted uh, by during the first wave. Um, and also the spread of the second wave to rural India. Uh, the, in, during the first wave, much of the spread was happening in, in urban India. If you went to Uttar Pradesh, uh, rural Uttar Pradesh, there weren't many infections as it were. But today, if you go to Uttar Pradesh, the, the, the situation is pretty bad. As for the vaccine administration, um, uh, as of um, uh, day before yesterday, 15% of the Indian population has received at least one dose of the vaccine, with 3.5% uh, receiving both the doses. Now, uh, this these numbers may look pretty bad, but let me also tell you, if you look at uh, the South Asian countries, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, the India is actually doing much better than most of these countries in terms of despite its population, uh, as far as the vaccination is concerned. We have three vaccines at the moment, Covaxin, Covishield, which is AstraZeneca, and Sputnik will be, I think, available from the 20th of June. Um, um, the the Crisis management, as it were, a COVID management, as it were. I think the government of India uh, and, and 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 in retrospect, I think they did the right thing by uh, massively shutting down the country. Where they did wrong, uh, where they went wrong, was uh, you know giving a five-hour notice to the uh, Indian provinces, Indian states, and to the population about the shutdown. Uh, we had a seventy-five-day shutdown from the twenty-fifth of March to the seventh of June which was a big shutdown. Um, but despite the shutdown, the pandemic continued to surge, uh, but but it was not, I mean, you know, uh, sitting in, in New Delhi, the urban landscape wasn't that affected. Um, the medical situation was not that bad. Access to medical care was still there. Um, and yet I would say the response of the country, given the fact that we have so many provinces, so many states, it's a huge country, right? I mean, 1.37, billion people, the response was not a uniform one, as it were. Um, now, as far as disease surveillance was concerned, um, there were disease surveillance measures by mid-January, and uh, um, a lot of travel restrictions and adversaries were, advisories were issued by the government of India. But that's, that's an entirely different, uh, uh, you know, argument altogether, whether India is prepared for uh, uh, disease outbreak and disease surveillance. We have so many ministries doing so many things. Um, the institutional collaboration is not all that, uh, 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 you know, great. I, 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 I did some work recently on um, biosecurity and biosafety, uh, you know, just to sort of try and understand how uh, a future uh, bioweapon attack or a biosafety outbreak, what, what could that mean for India? So the situation is not all that, all that um, uh, you know, reassuring, I would say. There was some contract tracing early on. Uh, there was some limited, ac uh, limited success as far as contract tracing was concerned. But I think as the, as the numbers started spreading, uh, it was simply not possible for the government to um, have that contract tracing in a, in a huge population such as this. Uh, lack of medical facilities was, again, something that uh, uh, you know, created hurdles in our COVID management. Uh, India has approximately 1.9 million hospital beds, 95,000 ICU beds, and 48,000 ventilators uh, for a country of um, 1,370 
uh, uh, million population, uh, simply not good enough, right? Um, the second wave, um, which is of course the most uh, important thing that we are all talking about today, uh, began in in the middle of February uh, 2021. Um, it started with Maharashtra, Punjab, then Delhi, and then of course now it's spreading to the rural areas. Um, the second wave emergency, and, and, and Walker, you were, in, you were in Delhi at that point of time, it was a very bad situation. You were looking at a very catastrophic situation, uh, right? Vaccines were running short, hospitals had no medicine or oxygen, uh, no beds for patients. Vehicles carrying COVID patients had to queue outside hospitals, waiting for someone to either pass away or get uh, cured for to get admitted. Many people sitting inside their cars, uh, you know, passed away in Delhi. Uh, there were queues outside cremation grounds. I mean, this was a, uh, a catastrophic um, uh, you know, situation uh, situation coming through as it were. Uh, in, from 2021 March onwards up until now, uh, COVID has killed almost 500 doctors. Um, you know, if that tells you anything about the emergency that uh, we faced. Um, you know, the government was not all that responsive. Uh, I mean, it didn't have many resources. So you were looking at social media handles, uh, asking for help and assistance with, uh, with oxygen cylinders, hospital beds, that, this and the other. Um, in, in some states like Uttar Pradesh, uh, reportedly dead bodies had to be thrown into the river or buried, buried in shallow grounds uh, because of the uh, increasing infection and because of uh, the lack of space in the crematoriums and a variety of other, uh, uh, due to a variety of other reasons as well. Now, what are some of the reasons why we were unprepared for the second wave? I think one major reason was the COVID fatigue after the first wave, right? I mean, the gap between the peak of the first wave around mid-September 2020 and the onset of the uh, second wave was about five months. Uh, so a lot of people looked at it and said, hey, we've sort of come out of that, you know, things are, things are going away. Uh, and India was doing much, pretty much better than the other countries. Um, the, the number of COVID-19 deaths per million population was 110 for India in January, January by January 15, 2021, while it was 987 for Brazil and 1,200 for the United States. Um, so we looked at these numbers and said, hey, we are, we are doing quite well because we are a relatively young population uh, with a median age of about 28.4 uh, years. Uh, and, and therefore, it is the older population that is getting affected in all of these countries, so India is safe. So I think that COVID fatigue and uh, false reassurance uh, uh, created a lot of problems. And, and this complacency led to uh, a lack of preparedness, as it were, um, right? When the second wave uh, started uh, peaking uh, or started, started beginning, the Indian health minister uh, declared that India was in the end game of the epidemic. Uh, it didn't stop there. Even the prime minister himself, uh, on the 8th of April, uh, during an interaction with the Indian chief ministers, Mr. Modi claimed that we defeated COVID without vaccines. Uh, you know, politicians tend to speak in hyperboles, but this was, uh, uh, you know, uh, this was new even for even even even, even for a hyperbole, um, right? So um, we didn't really make enough infrastructure uh, or stock medicines, uh, essential supplies such, such as oxygen for the second wave, uh, because despite the warnings by public health experts the government was not taking the situation seriously. It allowed, for example, the big Hindu festival called the Kumbh Mela uh, to continue in the month of April, uh, where millions of people came to the river Ganges and uh, you know, took the holy dip in the, in the river, etc. And this was a sp super spread ev event. Uh, and the elections, I mean, you know, India is a country of elections. We have elections every year five Indian states went to elections in the um, uh, last uh, three months alone and, and five big, big states as it were. And this also where, you know, tens of thousands of people, uh, 50,000 people, 60,000 people attending these uh, political rallies also led to a um, spike in, 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 uh, um, in, the, in the COVID epidemic. As far as vaccine availability is concerned, I think there also we dropped the ball in some ways, right? Most countries in 2020 were frantically placing orders for vaccines, uh, but India had not started the procurement of vaccines till January this year. Uh, and, and by the time we started placing orders for vaccines, 
um, the producers didn't have enough vaccines to give it to India. Uh, I think that was another uh, reason for the vaccine shortage. Um, so the impact of COVID, as, as Walker mentioned, uh, the in 2020, the Indian economy contracted by about 7.3%. Uh, um, um, and, and, and uh, you know, the um, unemployment rate um, shot up from 8% in March 2020 to about 24% um, um, in April 2020, uh, which is quite a high. I mean, that was the immediate impact of the lockdown. Of course, the unemployment rate is declining now. Um, after the second wave, uh, uh, the, the, the reopening has started and, and therefore the, uh, uh, the unemployment rate is declining. The human impact, I think uh, that is where the real uh, issue is. Uh, you're talking about the migrant workers, millions of migrant workers having to go back home with no jobs. I think that's a, that's a major hit. Um, the problem is that if, if you are, India is a country with very little uh, social security. Uh, if you're ill and if you're poor, uh, you are like you, your chances of getting healthcare is minimal. Uh, if you are rich um, and you are under you, and if it is a normal circumstances, you can get a medical care in a private hospital. Uh, now, what happened in Delhi in the last few months is that even if you are rich, you couldn't get access to medical care because the medical facility did not exist. Even if you are rich, I think that was that was a problem. So the poor, the low caste, and the women uh, were the worst hit in many ways. Um, the second wave, as I said, also uh, affected the rich. Um, in a country where there is little social security for the underprivileged, privileged, there was, this was really a hellish experience for a lot of people. Domestic, uh, domestic abuse, for, for instance, um, uh, reportedly also increased as a result of the pandemic and as a result of the of epidemic, etc. You're looking at a state with pathetic health care. And then on top of that, you're talking about a pre-existing social, poor social indicators, like very little, uh, very low life expectancy, higher, uh, very low, uh, higher fertility, uh, high child mortality, widespread, uh, widespread illiteracy, poverty, poor sanitary conditions, often de open defecation, etc. This is a deadly mix. And to that, you are adding a pandemic. I think, so you couldn't have asked for a, uh, more difficult situation, as it were. Uh, the cultural peculiarities also, um, in some sense, uh, complicated India's fight against COVID. Right? We are. This is a unique uh, country with a uh, lot of culturally rooted and domestically driven misinformation and misconceptions. Um, uh, for instance, there are local people who are talking about local remedies to treat COVID-19. Uh, popular yoga gurus who are talking about, uh, you know, quick remedies. Um, some fringe Hindu groups were uh, advocating the use of cow urine and cow dung for the uh, treatment of COVID-19. Now, the trouble is that you're talking about a, you're talking about a hugely illiterate population. And they are likely to fall prey to this kind of misinformation campaign and may not actually go to the hospitals, even, even if there are hospitals uh, for medical care. Um, then, of course, this led to a lot of communalization in India, you know, early on in January 2020, when the uh, COVID epidemic uh, uh, started uh, unfolding itself, you had a Muslim group which had uh, uh, gathered in Delhi for a particular event. So the, uh, you know, some some of the right wing Hindu groups started calling the COVID virus, Tablighi virus, or Corona, Jihad, and all of that. Uh, it has also had some impact on, and I'll take about two, three minutes more just to sort of wind it up, uh, Walker, before I come to you. Um, so center, it also had had some impact on the center state relations. Um, ever since uh, the BJP came to power, there, well, there was there was some uh, friction between the non-BJP ruled uh, cent, uh, 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 provincial governments in India and the BJP ruled uh, central government. Um, right, so this became worse during the uh, pandemic. Um, the vaccine procurement was one of the major uh, disputes between the uh, uh, states and the center. And now the, recently the, the Supreme Court ruled that the center should uh, procure the uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, the states were trying to procure the vaccines because the center said you can go out and procure vaccines, but the producers were not willing to uh, sell uh, these vaccines to the uh, states. So, so the center has now stepped in. Um, the authority, uh, so whose authority? Um, uh, you know, uh, rules whose authority is supreme under the 
epidemic epidemic diseases act uh, in india was another uh, um, sort of dispute between the center and the states uh, then the sheer lack of consultations between the central government and the state governments was another problem the lockdown for example uh, none of the state governments were consulted about the lockdown although uh, theoretically speaking, the central government has, central government has very little territory in India, right? It's the state governments that have the territory. So when the central government uh, announces a lockdown, this, the people are actually going to the states or going from one state to the other. So if the center announces that lockdown without consulting the states, it becomes a burden on the states. And that's precisely what happened. On the impact of uh, India's uh, of foreign policy and strategy, my own, my own understanding, and this is still unfolding, as it were. But my understanding is that the the uh, the, the sort of regional primacy that India has had um, in the South Asian region is going to take a definite hit. Uh, I mean, the rise of China has already been pushing India to the wall in the region. Um, China has deep pockets, and it has its own uh, BRI, and that is and the other, and therefore. There was a movement towards China uh, uh, by the states in South Asia. I think this is the COVID pandemic has um, um, quickened the inevitable in, in some, some sense. Um, that's one. And secondly, you're probably going to look at a lot more domestic political contestations uh, in India in the wake of the COVID-19 devastation. Um, and, and this domestic contestations, uh, which is likely to happen in the run-up to the 2021 uh, one of the major elections in India, which is Uttar Pradesh election, 2022 elections. Um, uh, and we, we, I mean, that, that's a huge state. Um, and, and, and this Uth Uttar Pradesh election 2022 will be the run-up to uh, the 2024 general election. So you're probably looking at a lot of communal tensions in the country, triggering more political violence. All of this will mean uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the country is going to be in a sort of... Uh, uh, bad um, negative mode, as it were. So a depressed economy, politically volatile domestic space, combined with the lack of elite consensus on strategic matters, um, will not inspire any any confidence in the international community about India, right? So on the one hand, therefore, you are looking at what are the implications of this situation of India losing its primacy in, in, in South Asia, domestic political contestations and a depressed economy. What are the implications of that? One, that India will be forced to be more conciliatory towards China, even though with a lot of reluctance. Um, in material power, in terms of balance of power considerations, political will, India is much diminished today when you compare it to China, for instance. Um, right, so India will have to therefore uh, be more conciliatory towards China, number one. Number two, I think post-COVID-19, the Indian foreign policy is unlikely to be business as usual. Um, I think the, the diplomatic bandwidth that India has uh, for expansive foreign policy goals will be limited. Um, and, and, and you're probably therefore going to look at a much depressed, uh, quote-unquote, Indian foreign policy. Um, the reminder of Mr. Modi's uh, uh, term, that is three more years, uh, is going to be uh, most likely, uh, you know, a holding operation uh, rather than anything very ambitious or expansive as it were. Finally, I think uh, COVID-19 will also uh, have some impact on uh, India's policy of maintaining what we call strategic autonomy, um, right? Um, so, you know, a post-COVID New Delhi would be would be would be finding it very difficult to resist demands for a closer military relationship with the United States on the one hand, and on the other, you know, you can't take aid from from some of these richer countries and then say no to everything else, no to criticism, for example. So I think they would come under a lot of pressure uh, on on many of these counts. I think I'll leave it at that, and um, happy to take any questions. Great, thank you uh, already so far. Um, we already have a question here, but uh, I would like to uh, use my role as moderator to ask you the first question. Um, in fact, uh, I would like to uh, go back to your beginning also, um, the lockdown. The lockdown of the, or the measures of the second wave as compared to the first wave in 2020 by the central and by the state governments. Uh, in your article, you yourself have, uh, have argued that um, it was necessary 
um, given the poor health infrastructure of India, to impose a hard and long lockdown, which was also done. Also, just now, um, again, you, you criticized that this was done with a very, very short notice. Um, now, if you look at the two differences, at, at the, I mean, the, the second wave was much higher, much more sudden, but the response to the first wave with the lockdown was more sudden than the wave itself. And um, the second wave, um, even though there was a lockdown imposed, um, cases started rising and they came down again. So um, just like many citizens in India, I was wondering if this uh, uh, lockdown measure was at all necessary. And mind you, this is also a question that people, or citizens of all countries have been asking themselves or their governments. So was the lockdown in this case really necessary um, or the way it was imposed in 2021 uh, had the governments already learned from 2020 and imposed measures only that were necessary? Or was it also just a measure in order to just do something against uh, the surge? Uh, you know, I think the answer to that is pretty complicated. Um, first of all, in, the, in 2020, when India imposed uh, the first sudden lockdown, um, you know, we only had about 1,000 cases at that point of time. Um, uh, and, 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 and in retrospect, I think this was the right thing to do, imposing that lockdown, uh, because that lockdown, in fact, I would say, um, uh, curtailed the spiking of uh, the pandemic to a great extent. But I think where it went wrong in 2020 was uh, without planning, the lockdown, and, and, uh, what the lockdown was announced and implemented uh, strictly without any proper planning, without any proper consultations. With the, uh, with the departments concerned, etc., with the states and even the various central government departments. Now, if you compare that to the 2021 lockdown, you're looking at tens of thousands of cases through February and March, but the government is still not imposing a strict lockdown, not because it, in my opinion, it be, not because it thought from an epidemiological point of view that the lockdown is unnecessary, but because it was clearly busy with elections, right? The, the central government was busy with elections. The election hearing had to happen through March and April, and therefore you are unwilling to impose a lockdown. So, so I don't believe in the theory that the second time this year, the lockdown was um, st staggered because there was a certain learning uh, from the first wave. No, I don't think. I think this was purely because of political considerations, number one. And number two, there was also the big Kumbh Mela that was taking place um, in, 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 Uttar, in, in Uttarakhand, in, uh, Uttarakhand uh, a major BJP ruled state. And this is important because in the upcoming elections in 2021, 2022, all of this is going to be important in sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing together the right-wing votes, the Hindu votes, as it were. Now, having said that, um, where the lockdown was, the lockdown in 2021 slightly different from the lockdown in 2020. Uh, yes, one because people were used to the lockdown, the idea of a lockdown, what it means, what you can open, what you can't open, how to deal with it. So there was. The general public was more used to it. The migrants also knew what to do and what not to do. So there was a learning among the general population. To, to some extent, even the government had learned its own lessons. Um, on, on um, For example, there, is, there should be no competing, no conflicting circulars. One state government, government does something, the other state government does something else. You know, those kinds of contradictions were mostly avoided in the second wave. Um, so I think it was some learnings were there in the second wave, but I think the manner in which the late lockdown was announced uh, was a function of political calculations rather than a, a, a function of any epidemiological rationale, as it were. Very interesting. Then allow me a, a follow-up question. Um, you have uh, now repeatedly criticized the government's decision to uh, continue holding the Kumbh Mela and uh, um, also the elections, but at the same time, um, you also mentioned that the elections had to happen. 
Um, and also, if you look back at December, January, by this time, um, all the decisions were already taken to uh, have the elections and to hold the Kump Mela. And you and I were also under the impression that the pandemic was more or less over. So what would you have done in retrospect now? What would you have done um, knowing that the, elect that the um, second wave hit? Would you have forbidden the uh, Kump Mela? Would you have um, postponed elections? Is it possible to uh, postpone five uh, legislative assembly elections in India? Well, I think, uh, again, of course, that's, that's an interesting but compl uh, co complex question as well. Let me put it this way. Let's come to the question of uh, the elections. If you are looking at uh, through the month of February, the infections were rising. They were not going down. So after the dip in January, you are looking at the rise through late February and uh, sorry through through March uh, and certainly in April um, the election commission came out with the statement that you know you cannot have uh, uh, huge election rallies you cannot have a big election campaign etc but here was the senior political figures from the ruling party the prime minister himself uh, you know uh, spearheading the election rallies in many of these states with the hundreds of thousands of people attending uh, flouting all rules put out by the Election Commission of India. Uh, now, either the Election Commission should have said to the Prime Minister and the others, you can't do this uh, and pull them up, mm -hmm. or they would have, they should have, or, or the Prime Minister and the Cabinet should have uh, made a decision, okay, we are not campaigning. None of this happened. When the Prime Minister himself is leading the election rallies, the opposition has no choice but to add to that uh, uh, the, the election election uh, uh, rallies and campaign as it were. Uh, now, if I think the epidemiologists, epidemiologists were warning clearly in March and April, it is not over, it is coming back, look at the data. The, the signs were there. It were, the signs were probably not there in January. The signs were probably not very, very evident in February, but it was clearly evident in March and definitely in April. Now, if, if you have a once in 100 year pandemic hitting your country and thousands of people are dying, definitely postponing five elections for a few months is not a big deal. It is it, it, it is not impossible to do that. I think it, this is, decisions could have been taken by the uh, uh, by the election commission. That was not done. So I think I would, in, not just in retrospect, even when the campaign was going on, a lot of people, including me, we were all saying that, hey, this can't go on. This needs to stop. Why don't you postpone the elections? So it was not as if the elections happened and then people start criticizing it. No, even during the campaign, we were, we were talking about it. That's number one. When you have the senior political leaders appearing in public without a mask, the general population, they will think, oh, this is all right. This is all right. This is setting, an, this is setting a bad example. That is exactly what happened. So everyone who was sitting at home, quarantining themselves or isolating themselves or uh, being under a lockdown suddenly came out, uh, thinking that, oh, the Prime Minister is saying everything is all right. Uh, as far as the Kumpu Mela is concerned, again, Kumpu Mela was, you're talking about uh, the mid, from the mid uh, January to the end of April. Uh, that was the period of the Kumpu Mela. On the 12th of April itself, you're looking at about 3.5 million, according to reports, uh, uh, you know, thronging to uh, the river. Uh, I mean, that is unimaginable. You can, you, if you thought that, okay, this is all right in January, fine. If you thought this was all right to have the Mela in February, that's all right. But when you know that this is spiking in February, March and in April, you went on till the end of April. I think that was unpardonable uh, from, from a public health point of view. I mean, there are also reports, I don't want to get into that, there are also reports that uh, the uh, the chief minister of Uttarakhand was changed because the former chief minister was quite strict about not having the Mela uh, in an expansive manner, but the central government was keen, the BJP was keen on having the Mela in the expansive way it had imagined because of its own its electoral implications, etc. So I think... I think from a public health point of view, from an epidemic point of view, this, these two were really bad decisions. Um, from a political point of view, uh, could the BJP have done uh, without the elections or uh, could they have uh, not campaigned? Uh, could they have not had the Kumela in Uttarakhand? These are political questions. Um, so, if I, so I don't know what I would do as a politician, but as a public, as, as a citizen, as a public health expert, I would say these were really wrong steps. 
I see. I think this is also uh, leading us now into the uh, direction of the implications of uh, these measures, uh, both in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, with the lockdown, um, I would like to take up uh, Ms. Tisevsky's question now. Um, she's asking what kind of social protection emergency measures did the government introduce during the second wave? Because in the first wave, uh, even in Germany, all around the world, we saw images of migrant laborers um, moving back to their country, um, back to their states. And uh, this also actually first brought the situation in India to the attention. Um, in other countries. And to what extent uh, did these measures address the needs of the most vulnerable groups to economic shocks? Uh, she's giving the example of self-employed workers in the informal economy. Right. Um, I think the answer to that question depends on uh, where you are looking for an answer from. Say, for example, if you're looking at Kerala, um, the government of Kerala would tell you that uh, we have a lot of migrant laborers in Kerala from West Bengal, from the north of India in general, and we made sure that they were given uh, food and uh, meals and they were given a place to stay and they were given primary uh, health care, etc., etc. And, and looking at Kerala's track record, um, a state that I come from, I quite believe that. Um, I think the second wave, uh, the social protection measures, to some extent, were uh, better than uh, the uh, 2020 experience, even in cities like Mumbai. Um, but I don't think that was the case across the board. For example, in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, a, a, a state that I visit quite often, uh, what is the state of uh, healthcare? Um, what is the state of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, da data collection on uh, the situation? The, the, the data collection is, you know, often it is said that the data is getting punched uh, by the mm -hmm. government itself because they don't want to show that, uh, you know, there is there is a major uh, uh, pandemic outbreak in Uttar Pradesh. The uh, public health facilities, even under normal circumstances, uh, even on a good normal day in 2018, your access to public health is uh, healthcare is pretty bad. Um, in 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 a, in a uh, village, rural Uttar Pradesh village or a rural Bihar village, uh, your ability to access healthcare on a normal day in a normal year is pretty bad. But uh, COVID-19 actually accentuates the problem. Uh, that is as far as the rural situation is concerned. In Delhi, I think the Delhi government, in the, when the second wave was unfolding, uh, uh, because the government of Delhi um, 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 is different from the central government in Delhi, right? The, 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 the government in Delhi, which is a slightly powerless uh, uh, provincial state, provincial government with its own limited powers, but they managed to sort of uh, ensure that, that there was some there are some facilities in terms of food and uh, um, uh, lodging for the migrant population. Uh, they were given a certain amount of healthcare facilities in the, in the second wave. But what happened the second wave was your small measures were simply not to go into measurement. Why? Because you're looking at for almost three to four weeks, uh, such emergency calls, you didn't have in a hospital beds you didn't have ICU beds. You didn't have oxygen cylinders. You didn't have remdesivir um, uh, medicine. You, you, so you're simply running short of these things for everybody, let alone for the the poor and the marginalized sections of the society. So it it hit everyone pretty bad in the in the sort of uh, second uh, wave. In the first wave, the vulnerable sections of the society were affected, and they didn't have anyone to go to, and they sort of ran home and that had its own impact. In the second wave, um, both the vulnerable and the uh, rich were hit. Uh, even the rich could not take care of themselves, uh, let alone the uh, vulnerable communities. Now, the vulnerable communities were given some facilities um, as a learning of the first wave by the Delhi government in the second wave. There were, there were provisions made for, as I said, um, you know, some medicines, uh, food and lodging, that was there. But I would, I would say, it depends from state to state. Um, the question, I think the fundamental question uh, that, that comes from that kind of a uh, query is this, is the government of India, well, and also the state governments because uh, health is a uh, state subject in India, right? Are, are these governments now going to put more resources into uh, uh, increasing and improving India's healthcare? I think that's a fundamental question. Um, 
you know, once you have vaccinated, now I, I think a lot of money has been uh, allocated for vaccination in the country. Once that vaccination spree is over, will this memory linger on and will policymakers invest in public health care? That is a question. And at this point of time, I mean, if, if you were to ask me if I can afford to go to a private hospital, any Indian who can afford to go to a private hospital will not go to a public hospital, unless and until it is the All India Institute of Medical Science, which is the best in the country. So unless and until you're talking about the top government's, government's hospitals in India, no Indian, if he can or she can afford, will only go to a private hospital. That needs to change. The question is, will that change? Will there be enough pressure for, or, or, or as far as that is concerned? And again, one state that is two states that are probably doing better on that count are Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Um, with a slightly more, uh, slightly improved uh, healthcare infrastructure, doctors, nurses, etc. So that needs to improve. Uh, yes, a very important question. Um, and um, I think all of India is curious to see uh, what kind of social protection measures the government will introduce after the pandemic. Um, one question quite related to this is um, the question of the unemployment rate um you had mentioned a very interesting figure that i was also not aware of with the rising unemployment rate after the lockdown uh, coming up to 24 percent um now the question here in the chat was uh, are these impacts are the impacts for daily wages also taken into account or are the figures only about the official employment rates so is there something like official employment and unemployment rates and um, how, how trustworthy would these figures be Yes, I think that's again a good question. Um, you know, we are probably, we are not obviously talking about uh, the government sector, clearly. Uh, the government, there is no unemployment in the government sector. I'm a government employee, for example, uh, although I, I work in the public sector, there's, because I work in the public sector university and therefore I'm a public, I'm, I'm a government servant, quote unquote. Um, so there is no unemployment as far as the government sector is concerned. Uh, once you get a government job in India, uh, you're there for good. Um, so you're probably you're then talking about the private sector, the organized private sector for the most part. Um, counting unemployment rates in the unorganized private sector in India is tough. So I am not so sure whether the uh, data point that we are talking about, 24% in April 2020, whether that captures the unorganized private sector. I am not so sure. I'll have to sort of look that up, how much of that gets captured in the, uh, in, in the unemployment, the count, as far as the count is concerned. But definitely we are talking about the private sector. Um, say, for example, you're talking about a restaurant, you're talking about, uh, um, um, you know, transportation, uh, you're talking about all kinds of that particular sector. And, and that gets reflected in the, in the data to a great extent. But there is a lot of, as you said, the daily measures um, are is, uh, the the unemployment cost by them. Is that reflected in this data? I'm not so sure. I don't think that is possible to reflect. Uh, I'm actually, uh, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not a durable economist. So I, my, my, my guess is, uh, my guess is it is not, uh, but I, I definitely can check on that. Before we go to your and probably also our favorite subject of uh, geopolitics, I uh, would still like to go um, about a question that uh, is, um, uh, interesting to the population all over the world right now, vaccines. And we have two questions right now on vaccines. I was thinking if, if these could be combined, but I don't think it's possible. So let me ask the question of Mr. Sari first. With a lot of vaccine production sites in India, will India aim for a fully self-sufficient vaccination program or towards an international approach, for example, relying on imports? Right. You know, see, the, um, um, many of these vaccines are produced in India by private players, but they produce these vaccines based on contracts from various countries. So if the AstraZeneca, uh, which is uh, the Serum Institute of India, SII, if they have a um, um, contract with a foreign country, they, that's a private, private player. They will have to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, produce the vaccines and give it. India was late, as I said, in, in placing orders. India was late in giving money to the Serum Institute of India. So you can't expect the private players to, um, um, you know, uh, cater to the Indian needs as, uh, you know, if, 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 if the Indian government applies much late, um, um, much later. 
um so until last month the confusion was who will order the vaccines until until a month ago the question is the central government ordering vaccines is the state government ordering vaccines the state government went to um you know various vaccine producers and abroad and and told them listen how about uh, we buy it directly from you the vaccine producers said we are not going to negotiate with 28 25 to 28 states you want to ask the central government and we will negotiate with what entity and that's that's understandable i mean who wants to negotiate with all of these putting out tender uh, and the negotiating a price and then importing it is simply impossible so two months ago three months ago india should have taken a centralized centralized decision of who is going to buy it what is the price how is how is it going to be distributed uh, all of this decisions should have been taken 3 months ago but unfortunately our politicians were busy with fighting elections but let me let me not politicize it let me come to the point yes india is a major vaccine producer uh, india is a major vaccine producer but not really in the public sector um, it, a lot of these vaccines are made by private sector players and they are and, and they are produced on order so what we are going to look at now we are probably going to look at uh, uh ramping up of the two vaccines uh, the production of these two vaccines which is uh, um the astrazeneca which is covid shield and covaxin and uh the russians have been good uh, to us and therefore we are now looking at uh, sputnik even sputnik is produced in india right even before so for example for the last 3 months sputnik has been uh, was was being produced by indian producers uh, for the russians so the uh, the vaccine gets produced in india it gets shipped to uh, russia for instance now we are saying all right give us some of that so the russians are going to allow us to use some of that in india itself um so i don't think india has the vaccine efficiency at this point of time uh, unless and until the ramping up for production is uh, going to be increased uh, manifold which is looking which is looking tough at this point of time so you're looking at just 15% of the population as i said which is which is good number uh, compared to uh, the rest of the neighborhood but remember they have a they have a small population to vaccinate we have a huge population to vaccinate uh this is also seamlessly going into the second part of the question and um, may i add at this point that um health minister harsh vardhan has announced that he would like to have or that he is planning if not even assuring the indian population to be vaccinated by the end of this year we have currently um around 3 million shots administered per day which means if we want to have a fully vaccinated indian population by the end of 2021 the number of shots being given per day would have to be 10 million um and of course the question is if this is at all possible or if it's too ambitious now the second question uh, on this regard uh, on the vaccines was as mentioned earlier a major problem in the pandemic response was that india couldn't provide enough vaccine to the population and i think even now the media is still full of this but on the other hand when it comes to vaccine donation through bilateral agreements how do you explain that india leads the list after china currently india donates a total of nearly 11 million doses of vaccine to about 50 different countries right i you know um um i i'm not so sure at this point of time india is donating vaccines i think the uh, yeah at this point of time india is not donating vaccines i think that stopped a month or two ago what is happening now is that uh, the the vaccines are going out of the country to other countries simply on the basis of contracts those countries signed with india's vaccine producers uh if a country pays the serum institute of india x amount of money and places an order in december last year the serum institute has to go go by the contract obligation there's no way of getting away from that so i don't think vaccine donation is a problem anymore but you know there was a time in december and january the uh, indian government was uh, going gang ho about uh, you know we are what what it called the vaccine maitri or vaccine friendship that we are uh, you know vaccinating the world and, and there are pictures and photographs of ministers um, you know sending off vaccines to xy countries ambassadors sort of indian ambassadors in those countries receiving it and handing it over we are seeing the exact opposite situation now my question i mean even at that point of time i was i was writing in the social media and giving interviews i asking a simple question uh, and my my point simply was that you know that there is covid 
you know that vaccines are necessary. So why are you giving me to other countries at all when you know, and people call that vaccine nationalism. So be it when you, you know that you have to vaccinate your own population. But they say, it's just 10 million doses, it's 5 million doses. I said, 10 million or 5 million, one, it is a certain number. And that is that number can be used, used internally, number one. Number two, your entire political attention or entire political uh, uh, capital is now geared towards vaccine maitri or vaccine friendship, whereas your political capital and political attention should be on vaccinating the domestic population. So we simply did not take that seriously. And, you know, the you know the officials and uh, the media were going on gung-ho about, you know, we are competing against China in, in, in sort of vaccine donations in the neighborhood. It is uh, Sinopharm versus, um, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Indian vaccine. I think that was a completely lopsided, uh, 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 non-strategic, very tactical view of things. Uh, I think it has come back to bite us in the back. And, and the point that you made, uh, Volker, about 10 million vaccines, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't see where that is coming from. I can't see the numbers. I can't see the vaccines. Uh, I think it is, it, is, it is probably, you know, a tall statement, an interesting political statement, but I, I simply don't see the vaccines uh, for vaccinating the entire Indian population in the next five months. Not happening. We are talking about the 15%. We are talking about 3.5%. Two. That's, that's quite a jump. Where is it coming from? Even if we have that many vaccines, it may not be possible to vaccinate all the population uh, by, the, by the end of by the end of the, by the end of the uh, year. You're talking about 1,370 uh, 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 million population, and that's not happened. Even if you have the vaccine, but you don't have the vaccine. Yeah, exactly. This is also an interesting aspect that you just brought up, that the infrastructure also needs to be there and not just the numbers. And the numbers, I think it's at least 2 billion doses that India alone will still require. And even ramping up uh, of production at Bharat Biotech and the Serum Institute. I think coming back to one of the questions that was asked earlier, I also think that India will have to rely on imports um, yeah. uh, or maybe even donations, which would be ironic since we were just talking about um, the uh, vaccine diplomacy and India was trying to be a benevolent actor in as a regional power. In fact, this is something, and now we're slowly coming to uh, the <laughs> favorite subject. Um, in your article, you were uh, depicting India um, or the, the, the approach, the regional approach of India as a soft one, uh, a soft power in the region probably or maybe as a counterpart to uh, China's regional approach. Now, um, has this failed? Because the, the, the vaccine diplomacy has failed and now it uh, has all transitioned into vaccine nationalism. I think uh, definitely the um, vaccine diplomacy is a spectacular failure. If it achieved anything, what, what do you gain from vaccine diplomacy? You gain goodwill, you gain soft power from vaccine diplomacy. One, you couldn't, one, we could not see through the entire process of vaccine diplomacy. We promised, we said, you know, X amount of vaccines were coming your way, but that, 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 was, that, that had to be stopped midway through, number one. Number two, China has taken over. Uh, the whole vaccine scene in the region um, uh, to, to some extent Russia. So you, you're looking at India losing out to China in the vaccine diplomacy hands down. Uh, India had some advantage in the beginning. You know, the Quad talk about, talked about, you know, some kind of vaccine alliance and things of that kind, but that never really uh, went anywhere. So I think from a, from a soft power point of view, soft balancing China in the region, using vaccines as a diplomatic tool um, uh, did pick up initially at the cost of Indian lives. Uh, but I think that has uh, spectacularly failed in my, in my personal opinion. Um, uh, China is far ahead of um, uh, clearly vaccinating its own population and the neighborhood um, and, and even the extended neighborhood as it were, including, including Africans. Uh, so I think on that count, we have failed. I have no, I have no doubt about it. But India is spearheading the initiative to um, do away or at least temporarily do away with intellectual property on vaccines globally, along with uh, South Africa and even uh, the US president has recently expressed his um, uh, positive attitude towards this initiative, which is something that, you know, could 
support uh, India's positive um, and benevolent uh, soft approach, don't you think? Sure, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of, look the other way of looking at it is that we need the vaccines, therefore we are asking for it. Sure, it will benefit others, <laughs> but definitely we need the vaccines. Therefore, we are pushing for uh, waiving the uh, patents. Uh, it will definitely help the others too, uh, but that's not where it is coming from, right? Right. Um, now, when we're talking about uh, international relations, we have seen that um, during the pandemic, uh, there were quite some interesting developments in India's bilateral um, relations. Um, of course, we have to mention China with high tensions starting after um, the, uh, after the standoff, the military standoff uh, in Ladakh between the Chinese and the Indian army. Now there's also a negative public sentiment uh, because of the, in, in India, because of the COVID-19 virus originating uh, in China. Um, do you think that this um, high tension which has slowly eased a little bit uh, earlier this year after at least there was a, um, an agreement uh, to withdraw, or at least temporarily withdraw um, soldiers from the borders. Uh, do you think that this will in the near future continue to escalate? Uh, is, is the relationship with China now strained or do you have reasons to be optimistic? I really don't have any reasons to be optimistic about the China situation. I continue to believe and I, I, you know, I have always believed, for example, that Pakistan is a problem for India and India should resolve its problems with Pakistan and move on. For one, it is good to have peace with Pakistan. But secondly, and more importantly, India's bigger strategic challenge going forward is China and not Pakistan. Uh, if India continues to be caught up in smaller fights with Pakistan on Kashmir or on Siachen or Sir Creek XYZ, then we are allowing China to box India in the South Asian geopolitical region as it were. So India needs to resolve its conflicts with Pakistan. India needs to resolve any conflict that it has with its neighbors and focus single-handedly, single-mindedly on the China challenge. China challenge is the future. The disengagement, I mean, without getting into the details of that, I will say in my own understanding, the disengagement on the line of actual controls, control is not really on India's terms. It is pretty much on, on, on China's terms. To my understanding, China has an upper hand in the in the after in the, in the wake of the 2020 standoff between India and China, the line of active controls, China has a territorial upper hand. So it is not, in my opinion, in, in, in to India's advantage on India's terms. Thirdly, China has basically told India by unleashing a border aggression right in the middle of the pandemic, middle of 2020. India said that we are putting you in your place in some ways and and there is a lot more there's increased there's increased cooperation between china and pakistan today one of india's traditional friends russia is closer to china than ever it's getting closer mm -hmm. to pakistan we don't know the future of uh, russia india relations as it were so to, in many ways therefore india is located in a very difficult geopolitical space today you have you have china on the one, one side pakistan on the other there is a restive situation in kashmir there is there are northeast insurgencies of course you have you have you have a depressed economy you have a depressed foreign policy you have the economic activity uh, um, you know in the wake of covid um, uh, it, if, if, if it picks up good but we don't know how how far how, how much time it will take for us to go back to uh, say uh, 2018, 2019, not that things were fantastic at that point of time. My own benchmark is probably, you know, 10 years ago when you, when, when you were talking about uh, the economic growth of India in uh, uh, 2008, 9, that period, that was the golden, the golden period. Um, so so what, you, what, what you are then looking at is a country that has very little diplomatic political capital, to spend on foreign policy. 
uh, be it engaging its neighbors, be it engaging the great powers, be it you know, contributing to the running of the system, the international system, as it were. To, I mean, a, a, lot of it, a lot of people ask, when Indians ask for a seat on the permanent seat on the UN Security Council, and I, I do believe India should, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it, is, it is a major chunk of the humanity, it represents a major chunk of the humanity, it should get a... So the question they ask is, so what are your ideas for UN Security Council? What are your ideas for the international system? What, what can you contribute to the international system? I think that's a fair question. Have we made up our mind? And, and today, in the wake of all of this, do we have something to contribute to shaping of the international system? I'm not so sure. I think that's the problem. Um, just by size and might, just by the sheer size, uh, you may not necessarily be able to make an impact on the international system. You need to have the intentions, you need to have the strategy, you need to have the tools. The question that I think we Indians should ask ourselves is that, do we have them in place, the, the strategy, the, uh, the, the, the uh, tools and the, and, the, and the ideas? I'm not so sure. And now with COVID, we may not even have that uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, desire to be an active member of the uh, system shaping, an active and system shaping, shaping member of the international system. Well, this uh, clearly makes one think. And uh, is it uh, correct that if I assume that you see the negative development with the China-India relation overshadowing the positive recent development in the India-Pakistan relations? Uh, no, I think uh, uh, the development between India and Pakistan is definitely a positive one. Uh, if you actually look at it, if we refer to the, the ceasefire agreement between India and Pakistan yeah, on the 25th exactly. of February this year, that was, I mean, as I wrote in the Hindu, that was probably the biggest military measure between the most important military measure between India and Pakistan in the last 18 years. Um, right, so it is a major step, but it is a tactical step. It is not a strategic step simply because a strategic step would require you to get into a larger conversation about the broader issues. That hasn't happened. So you have signed, India and Pakistan have signed or agreed to a ceasefire, there's no signature, it's just a phone call, agreed to a ceasefire, uh, and it's an informal ceasefire. I have an entire book on the ceasefire, um, you know, violations between India and Pakistan. But it hasn't moved an inch thereafter. If you go back to the previous ceasefire agreement of 2003 November, in 2004, you see a slew of measures. The trade talks happening, the Kashmir talks happening, an entire back channel of Indian and Pakistani negotiators from 2004 to 2007, negotiating and almost finalizing a deal on the Kashmir question. In the middle of 2007, the Indian Prime Minister was supposed to go to Pakistan and sign that, but because of domestic political issues in Pakistan, that couldn't have happened. So what you saw in the wake of 2003 November ceasefire has not happened so far in the wake of the February 2021 ceasefire. Having said that, and having talking to interlocutors in Pakistan, we do a lot of practice with the Pakistani side. My own feeling is that Pakistan is waiting and watching because they also realize that Indian political and diplomatic attention is entirely on COVID. So is Pakistan in, in many ways. Pakistan has, um, uh, you know, vaccinated a, a much less uh, a chunk of its, its population. Its economy is in bad shape. Um, uh, and, and yes, an Afghan situation to deal with, as it were, uh, because of the withdrawal of the American forces uh, from Afghanistan. So Pakistan, both countries are busy with other things. So the tactical ceasefire that has that has been agreed to has stood the test of time so far. No one ceasefire violation in the last uh, uh, se several months after 2000, after after 20, uh, after the February 25th ceasefire. Now. How do I link that to the whole China equation? Um, you know, what, what is interesting to note, Walker, here is that if we go by the traditional argument that there is a collusion between China and Pakistan, and I think at a broader strategic level, there is a, uh, you know, uh, there is, there is a uh, China-Pakistan sort of uh, 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 angle towards India, as it were. But uh, when the standoff between India and China were going on, was going on, Pakistan did not step in to take advantage of the situation. Pakistan stayed quiet. Pakistan did not increase the firing. It was business as usual between India and Pakistan. 
So I think to my mind, that sends a message. And the way I read that message is that we are not trying to make, we are not trying to fish in the troubled waters when you have a situation with China. Mm -hmm. You settle the situation with China. Even China hasn't really stepped in, at least in the past, when India and Pakistan had its own their own troubles. So they have stood away from uh, any any bilateral issues that India has had with either of them. At the strategic level, transfer of weapons, technology, all of that happens. Missiles, all of that happens. But at the tactic level, that hasn't really happened. So I am I am I'm sort of still, therefore, optimistic about the fact that despite the not so conclusive Atmos strategic atmosphere that we have, India has in the name in, in the region, China, Pakistan, and, and 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 all of that. I still think it is possible for India to diffuse one situation at a time, especially with Pakistan. Where I'm where I'm not so optimistic is the China front. I think China is a rising superpower, and it wants India to see it as a rising superpower, and 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 it is unwilling to talk to India as an equal. I think that's where the problem is. Hmm. All right. Uh, we have now uh, reached the end of our time, but with the grace of the host, I would like to ask you one more question, not only because uh, um, it's from the audience, but also because it's a major topic of Hans Seidel Foundation throughout the world. It's on federalism. And uh, you had also pointed out earlier that the Uh, let me quote, or oh, that was in your article. They were confusing and conflicting guidelines by the state and national governments uh, when the lockdown was imposed. Um, and uh, we have one question also in the Q&A. Health is a state subject and the response to collective threats linked to the subject required some kind of organization of federal responsibilities on a functional basis. Now, if you could give a very short answer on this, how could have How could a um, response that respects the federal responsibilities of state and national actors in India could have looked like? You know, I think I think the problem really was that uh, the, as I said, the management of the lockdown, the management of the disease, the the roadmap for lifting restrictions, um, you know, uh, by 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 various states and the central government. Uh, the allocation of financial resources from the central government to state governments. Um, these things should have happened in a coordinated uh, and consultative manner. Uh, but that is not what we saw. I think that is a real problem. Uh, clearly, in the Indian scheme of things, there are, um, uh, you know, the central government takes precedence over the state governments. Um, that is that is all right, and we have we have lived with that with that over the decades, and we are fine with that. The problem the problem happens when you have a central government, and I don't want to get too political about it because it's mostly domestic political, right? When you have a central government that looks sometimes favorably on those state governments that are that are governed by the same political party that is in the center. And not so favorably at those states which are governed by political parties that are in opposition to the party in the central government. You know what I'm getting at? The non-BJP parties and the, the BJP uh, ruled states. So the BJP ruled states probably had more financial allocations from the central government. The non-BJP states did not, kept complaining about the lack of financial allocation from the central government. The ability of the state governments to talk to the central leadership is higher when you have a uh, BJP government in the center and not an opposition government in the uh, not not I mean when you have a uh, when you have the same government in the uh, uh, center and the same political party in the center and in the state. This was not a problem earlier. I mean, you had the you had you had BJP governments earlier. You had the Congress governments earlier. The functioning was functioning was pretty smooth. There is a laid down set of procedures. There is a business uh, uh, procedure how 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 the business happens between the two sides, and there was no quote unquote pettiness in the dealings with each other. But now, increasingly, we are looking at during the pandemic, and in the wake, um, and even during the second wave of the pandemic. You're looking at 
a lack of interest in consulting, a lack of interesting interest in seeking advice. The central government is not, let's face it, the epitome of all wisdom. Well, no government is the epitome of all wisdom in any case. So it is important that you reach out to the state governments and ask them advice about uh, the, the roadmap for list, lifting restrictions or the uh, management of the lockdown, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That did not happen. So, to, to, so my limited answer is, is that there should have been more goodwill between the two sides. There should have been more uh, responsible consultation between the two sides. As, as a citizen, I did not see that happen. And that was, that was pretty sad. I see. Uh, this response probably is applicable to probably most federations um, in this uh, in the world in this year. Um, for those who would like to learn more about the allocations of or the fiscal allocations between center and the states in India, I invite you to uh, look at the homepage of Hans Seidel Foundation India, uh, since we had just an interview um, on exactly this topic. Um, we are. We have come to the end of our fourth episode of Asia's Fight Against COVID-19 series. Uh, there will be a short survey for uh, for those that uh, leave the event now. Please take your time. It's really just half a minute to fill it out and will help us also in the future um, to give us your opinion. Follow us on other events also like this. The next one in this series will be on Kyrgyzstan. Also very interesting. It will take place on 30th of June and you can find also the link uh, if you follow us uh, on our social media. And as a reminder, we will send you Professor Jacob's article um, by email and um, the full publication will be uploaded at a later stage this year. Professor Jacob, this was a delight. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope that we can have more events like this together and then maybe we talk only about international relations and conflicts and ho Thank you, hopefully in a, in a positive uh, manner. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Great pleasure. Thank you so much.